Hey everyone and welcome to Sasquatch Theory. In this episode I am interviewing Fred from Alaska. He has had some really frightening encounters with the Sasquatch. You often hear of the Sasquatch being gentle and shy creatures who wish to avoid human confrontation. But in the last frontier of Alaska, many dangerous creatures roam the woods. With many locals reporting Sasquatch-like creatures coming into their villages and terrorizing the people. I was fortunate enough to get in contact with Fred who was willing to share some of his experiences and encounters. The encounters that Fred experienced in his life with the Sasquatch were not positive in any way and still to this day he finds hard to talk about. Just be respectful in the comments and if you don't believe, just move on, it's that easy. If you enjoy this type of content please be sure to like and subscribe and if you have had a Sasquatch encounter and would like to be a guest on the show please email me at sasquatchtheory at outlook.com. All right, everyone, let's dive into this next Bigfoot encounter from the state of Alaska. Hey, Fred, and welcome to Sasquatch Theory. I appreciate you being on the show, man. Yep, my pleasure. Yeah, if you would, could you take us back to your encounters and tell us about what you experienced and maybe what you saw? Oh, for sure. Um, some of my oldest memories are of, you know, warnings of the hairy man out in the woods. You know, don't go out in the woods alone. Don't turn your back on the woods, that kind of thing, you know. But we weren't raised like uh, with the old native tales and the old native myths of the hairy man and things of that nature. Uh, a lot of my older relatives were in the fishing industry and more sophisticated than the old ways, if that makes sense. So we didn't get a lot of the like uh, the elders guidance as far as mythological stories from our past kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Anyway. Um, some of my earliest memories is berry picking. Um, we'd be out on the tundra and you'd hear a, a howl or a, a hoot off in the distance and you'll see shadow figures running off in the tree line and what have you. Um, let me see. This I was is in with... Alaska, correct? Can you kind oh, of describe Oh yeah, I'm sorry. This, I'm sorry. Yeah. Bristol Bay, Alaska. Uh, north of Dillingham on the Nushigak River or the Wood River up in Wood Tick Chick State Park. And that's extremely remote, correct? Uh, yeah, yeah. And then some, <laughs> yeah, okay. it's, it's very remote. Um, a few small villages here and there, but nothing of any. I mean, the largest populous place was Dillingham, and there's roughly maybe 2,400 year round residents kind of fluctuates you know yeah <clears throat> even less back back in the day but uh me and three of my cousins we were berry picking and we're up by this place called snake lake in a snake lake mountain it's uh just off the road between dillingham and electnagic we're back up on some of these rises where the berry patches were and stuff and must have been about eight or nine maybe somewhere in that somewhere in that age frame and uh, one of my cons uh, cousins, Spencer, he starts crying and he sits down and he kept pointing at the woods. Uh, he said something through a rock at him. And we're from the tree line at this point. I was a little kid, but we we're a good 100 yards from the tree line. Like nothing through a rock at him that we could tell. <clears throat> so we went, found my auntie. She was over the rise, got her attention. Tell her, you know, hey, your boy's crying. Well, another rock comes in and almost hits us. There was a group of three of us. It almost hits us, and it's about the size of a baseball. And we're, then that really got our attention because it wasn't just him throwing a fit because he didn't want to keep up with us, making excuses, you know, little kid stuff. But it, it got real. So we we turned the direction of where the rock came from, and all we heard was this real loud howl. And it was like on about three different octaves, a real low one and 
two upper octaves, like real high pitched. Sound like a woman being murdered with a, a deep lion growl in the background. Kind of hard to explain. <clears throat> so that got our attention and my aunt's attention for sure. And she got us the hell out of there. That was just a kind of a brief thing that happened. We didn't have any visual on it or anything like that, but it was loud and clear. And there was a bunch of thrashing and you could see the trees moving and stuff. Real creepy. Um, but it's still, to us younger kids, it wasn't real yet. You know what I mean? It was just talk, oh, the hairy man. Let me see. In, oh, what year was that? We moved away in 85. But we would come back every summer and stay through the fall for hunting. And I believe it was in 87 or 88. We uh, we had an extended stay up from where we lived down in the States, the lower 48. And uh, we were staying with my grandma. And there was uh, about six of us. We, uh, we were all going to go up the Wood River by skiff and go to this place called uh, Sorensen Scows, where uh, a family had some old fishing scows and stuff anchored up off the side of the Wood River. So we all take off early in the morning, caught the tide from where we had to launch the boat at the Wood River Landing in Dillingham there. And uh, on our way up, we decided to pull into the McClung River and do a little uh, sport fishing on our, our way. Silvers were about to be running, so all the kids were excited. You know, there was about three or four of us kids and a couple adults were cruising along. We get up in there, and there's these little sloughs that jettison off the, the McClung River. It's not a very big river. It's just a tributary to the Wood River. <clears throat> we start casting away. You know, we're crossing lines, and just being kids excited to fish. And all of a sudden, there's a huge splash just up the river from us, real big. Boosh. We couldn't see it because we were in one of these little sloughs trying to um, basically cut off the salmon. <laughs> you know, we were trying to kind of block their way back out and try to cast up and, you know, catch them anyway. We are just doing dumb stuff. So as we were backing out of there after casting a little while because we still needed to get upriver, um, as we were drifting back down, we, could, uh, we came into view of where the splash originated. And there was an upside down pine tree uh, root still on it. It wasn't old or beetle kill or none of that. It was fresh. This thing had been ripped out of the ground and speared right into the center of the, the little river. It didn't block us or anything. It was just above us. But we saw that and we're like, where in the hell did that, you know, none of it made sense to us. None of it. So the adults, you know, they freak out. They get us out of Dodge. You know, we, we go up river, we go up to the Sorensen Scows, uneventful. In the meantime, all this stuff going on throughout the years, there's always been sightings here. Um, certain places you don't go berry picking. You'd see a lot of times you could see these things off in the distance running the tree line, but it's so easy to dismiss it as something else if you didn't know if you weren't aware of what was going on. Like we were raised knowing Harry man was real. You know, we were warned, stay out of the woods, don't go alone, all that stuff. One thing I, I feel is, is they don't want to be our friend. I've never, I've never had any warm fuzzy moments or any, any kind of interaction that was in any way greeting. Um, like they wanted to be friendly in any way. Everything was always initiated by them, whether it be throwing sticks, rocks, screaming, um, that type of thing. Never have I gone looking, if that makes sense. There's never, uh, no one I knew back there ever wanted to go find one. They were always scary. You know, it wasn't, wasn't something you just wanted to go and pick up as a hobby. <clears throat> well, I'm going to give you the, the long version of what happened in 2006 because it's going to take a little while to uh, lay it all out. We were, it was into the fishing season and one of my relatives wanted to go gold panning. There was 
you know, big talk about gold upriver and this and that. And the place he wanted to go was way up the Nushkek River towards Iliamna, um, way up there. I mean, uh, past all the villages that were on the wood, uh, Nushkek River before you get to Lake Iliamna. It's kind of hard to explain. Um, I don't have a map in front of me exactly, but. So we took a couple days getting ready. This was mid-September. Had the gold penning stuff. Uh, had all our supplies. We had a couple different outboards. We had a jet, 40 horse, for the lagoons we were going to come across. And we had a regular outboard drive, uh, prop drive. <coughs> Excuse me, being out in the cold yesterday just gave me kind of a harsh voice, so forgive me. Oh, you're fine. Anyway. If you need to take a drink, if you need to pause, just let me know. I... Yeah, no, I'm good. I got my coffee right here. I'll just take a sip now and then. But um, we're getting ready. And like I said, it takes a, a couple days to gather up where, you know, where is this kicker left? Is it over at this relative's house? Yada, yada. We get everything together and we head out. Now this by river is a very long distance um days by river we we had a couple stops we stayed in the studio hawk for a few days for my older relative to recoup from being on the water it gets freaking cold no matter what the ambient temperature is sorry every time i talk about this i hair starts standing up on the back of my neck just because it is uh anyway pushing forward <laughs> We uh, we talked to some relatives there in New Stuyahawk and uh, spent a couple days there. This is, like I said, mid-September. Um, we continue on. I don't remember exactly how long it took to get all the way up to the Nuyakuk, but it was a leisurely thing. We were in no rush. My older relative was in, uh, in his upper 60s. Uh, he wasn't, like, crippled up or anything, but he wasn't spry. He, he got around, but barely, you know, and <laughs> so we, it was his planned out trip. We were going by his rules. So we take our time. Now, where we went up on the Nuyakuk River, it's uh, the Tikchik Lake, one of the northernmost lakes in the Wood Tikchik Park area, feeds it at the waterfalls. <laughs> they had a salmon counting station up there, a weir tower. And the observers had built this little lean-to shack. I mean, this thing is chintzy, a glorified cardboard box. It was 5 eighths plywood and 2 by 4 construction with a little 50s-style eggshell camper attached to it on the backside. And they had uh, boarded off the rear window of the thing and made it into their little bunk area. So it was this camper with a, basically a glorified lean-to attached to the face of it. <laughs> it was like eight foot square, a whole lot of nothing as far as real protection. It was basically keep the water off, maybe some of the wind. Had two little windows in the thing, and that was it. And the door was plywood and two by four with a little hook latch. I mean, literally a glorified box. <laughs> we get up there, and I wanted to go bear hunting. I wanted a new black bear rug for three or four years at this point. Heard a bunch of stories about big black bears up in this area, so I am stoked. Had a brand new 870 Remington pump. I had uh, got it in the village, so it was real expensive. It was rifle barrel. Had the ghost ring combat sights. Beautiful gun. I was real happy with it. Anyway, I had that, and I wanted to use some slugs and drop a black bear. So I'm, I'm dwelling on that. And we get everything unloaded into this little shanty. <clears throat> I wanted to go right then and go look for bears, but it was getting dark and we didn't want to be on the river. We're chilling out. Uh, my relatives start, there's just three of us. So they start playing uh, a card game of some kind on this little card table next to one of the small windows. Now, I, I don't know exactly how much time had passed, but when we got there, this, this is not a good spot for a cabin or a little shack. It's on the high bank. Um, it's a high erosion area, but that's where the observers built it, I guess. We, uh, where you park your skiff, there's 
very little beach. It's like someone added some gravel. There's just enough area there to kind of, and nothing to tie off to. So when we beach up, we have a long ass anchor line that we drug up over the, the bank because the bank was about six, seven feet high <laughs> on that side where we're at. We had to drag it back over and anchor into the tundra a ways back just so the skiff didn't get pushed away in the current <laughs> it's relevant later <laughs> so uh we're up in there and I, I don't remember exactly how much time had passed but it was it was starting to get dark this is fall in alaska so we're probably at roughly 12 and 12 on the light cycle <laughs> so it was looking real nice you know off in the distance with the sun setting and everything and uh, I was adjusting the sights on this shotgun because, like I said, it was brand new. I maybe put four or five rounds through it on the way up river, just plinking around. So I'm adjusting it, tweaking it, whatever. All of a sudden, the whole place just shifts. Uh, makes this creak. Uh, I'm getting the chills. The whole place creaks. Just uh, the whole place shifts. Kind of look at my cousin. and <laughs> They're both looking back at me like, what the hell? Well, my older relative, deaf as a stump, he was my uncle, he was deaf, just deaf. So he was going by lip reading, and he didn't hear anything, but he said he felt the creaking in the floor. So we're looking, I'm looking at my cousin, and I see movement behind his shoulder in the window. It, uh, man, hair standing on the back of my neck hard. Um, got the hard goosebumps. Anyway saw movement and I, yeah, he saw the expression on my face and he jumped up and grabbed the 30 odd six. And I said, I think there was a bear outside because we weren't thinking hairy men at the time. It, it just wasn't, we're up there to fish in gold pan. Well, <coughs> <coughs> at first he jumped, when he jumps up, he thought I was teasing him and I was like, no. And he saw the expression on my face and <coughs> There was something in the air. It was like everything got uh, a lot of pressure in the air. Uh, it's hard to explain. Almost like your ears are half popped, but they haven't popped yet. You know, when you're gaining altitude, that kind of thing. So uh, we're kind of, he, he started taking it more serious because everyone felt the, the pressure. It was just real weird. Just So we're assessing the situation. We're, do we're talking about, okay. If it's a brown bear, should we put it down? If it's a black bear, is it the one I want? You know, just frivolous stuff about shooting or chasing off a bear. Like I said, it was, Harry Man wasn't on our radar. <laughs> we had one of these uh, spotlights that we used for hunting every year. Million candle watt power or some crap. Uh, they worked for all of 10, 15 minutes. Anyway, it's what we had. And we had some smaller flashlights, but that was our main one. And... uh we get a game plan. We'll open the door. We'll beam around. We'll find the bear. We'll scare it off. Or if it's the black bear I want, I'll drop it. You know, we had our game plan. Now, when I push the the riverbank we we're on, the tree line is about 50 yards back from the riverbank. And the little shanty shack is about maybe five yards off of the the bank's edge. Not a good place. <laughs> that's just how they had it set up. So when we open the door, we're immediately looking towards the tree line and I turn on the spotlight and all you saw was three sets of amber eyes off at the tree line. Now these were so big. I thought they were fence post markers. Like, and I, I started asking them, is there fence post markers over there or something that I missed? Because this is a remote place. You know, you don't expect to see anything reflective in the trees. You know, it, it, you just don't. It's too remote. And just as he was telling me no, we got a real eerie feeling. Like, there was no movement from the eye shine. But we just got this real creeped out feeling. It's hard to explain. So we jumped back inside and shut the door. <sighs> Uh, getting the chills thinking about it, my neck's tightening up, but so we're standing there just a moment, like not very long, trying to discuss what had eye shine like that. Now in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, 
something it just something's not adding up well all of a sudden he goes from next to me underneath that card table like in a shot just terrified freaked out he's underneath the table and he's holding the 30 odd six by the barrel um like clutching it like he was churning butter or something but he was on his back under the table i'm looking over at my uncle like what the hell is this and i'm kind of looking around trying to figure out if you know what the hell and i could tell he's looking at the opposite window from where he's at uh, get the show thinking about i look over and in the the light of the little pump up Coleman white gas lamp, we saw two huge amber red eyes in the outline of a head. Big. It 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 gave me a shock to my system um, that I had never felt before in my life. Now I've I've seen these things before. I've seen them at a semi decent close distance, but they would run off make a lot of noise maybe come back and peek from a tree line it was nothing ever in your face you know it was always at a distance well this thing was like less than five feet from us on the outside of this chintzy ass glorified cardboard box and it is uh, the creepiest shit like so seeing that the thing blinked when because everything went slow motion at this point i could feel the my heart beat in my eyes right now so it blinked its eyes and started moving out of view of the window towards the little corner and i'm still holding the shotgun and just on autopilot i put three shots through the wall boom 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 there was a loud scream and the whole place shifted uh, it, it shifted a couple feet i i thought for sure we're gonna go on the river uh, I mean, that was the first thing on my mind was all shit. Now, my uncle, he grabs a lantern right after this and goes back into the little uh, little sleeping area, little 50-style eggshell back part of this lean-to where there's two bunks on one side, two on the other. Excuse me, this gets my heart rate up. So uh, I'm sitting there. I just shot. And there was so much pressure in the air. I didn't hear no ringing in my ear from the shotgun. This is a small area. This is a 12 gauge. Kaboom. You know, I was shooting serious rounds, <clears throat> but there was no high pitch ringing in the air, nothing. It was just a lot of pressure in the air. So after the scream and the shift, there's some weird garbled noises in the distance. Uh, nothing outside of just strange sounds uh like imitation of bird calls uh owl hooting weird clicking um see the the scream was weird uh very high pitched but like i'm into competition stereo systems so i like the real low notes from the bass well this scream Although all you could hear was a high pitched part of it, you could feel the the notes you couldn't hear. Like it had to have been sub twenty hertz, because we can hear everything down to about twenty hertz or so. It had to be below that, whatever octave it was. Just the creepiest stuff. Now I'm full fledged panic because I just shot. Uh, my cousin's under the table, freaked out. Um, I, I I tried to get the the 30 odd six from him because more powerful rifle i wanted more punch for the next time i have to shoot but i didn't want to the way he was freaked out i didn't want to accidentally shoot him because it was loaded and the way he was holding it just wasn't good so my uncle's back in the bunk area he kills the lantern now when he killed the lantern there's still enough light outside where you can see shadows move by the windows there was shadows moving by the windows real close to it, but not a noise, not a sound. Like, just anybody that close up on it, you would have heard them, like, walking by. Because this is literally a box. It's, there's nothing to it. You could hear outside almost as well as you can inside. Uh, it's literally that kind of place. So it's, it's deathly quiet. I'm, I'm beyond freaked out. <clears throat> 
I, I literally at this point, my uncle shut down. My cousin's under the table and is of no help at this moment. He had wet his pants. Um, he was freaked out. I, I was trying to hold it together. I'm trying to think, how how am I going to do this by myself? I felt all alone. Um, I kept getting this overwhelming feeling to make a break for it. And that, it was, you know, I love these people. I wasn't leaving them anywhere. But the, it was real weird. It wasn't like a mind speak thing or anything. It was like the survival mode. And trying to fight with my own emotions because it i was at in that moment in time i was up. i i was not right i was holding this shotgun trembling mumbling to myself trying to come up with the a game plan here now the sun just is going down we have 12 hours of darkness that and is dawning on me at this point that we have to get through in order to see to get out of there on the skiff because you can't go down the river at night and pitch black even with lamps you know, lamps and stuff you're gonna hit something it's just dangerous so i'm sitting there trying to plot and plan in my mind i don't know how much time had gone by but i had gotten a lamp relit because I, I just i needed light uh my mind was playing tricks on me as far as seeing stuff inside the the shack it was all bad so I get it lit and every micro movement struggle, it's panic. Like the fear was on a, on a level that I, I've never felt before. Um, it, it's hard to explain unless you felt it, it, it won't make sense because it was so primal and so embedded deep. It, it, it's hard to express. Um, oh, maybe you have. <laughs> or those who have experienced these things might know what I'm talking about. But this was a very primal, holy shit, like, this ain't freaking happening. You know, that's what was going on in my mind is this isn't happening. I This is something's, well, I don't know exactly how much time had passed. My cousin started communicating again. And... I asked him, I was like, dude, what did you see? You know, did you see anything different than we did? Because we saw the eyes, it blinked, I shot. You know, uh, what did you see? He said, it showed me its teeth. And I said, when did it show you its teeth? He said, just before I hit the floor. He said, I was going to try to shoot it, but all I could do involuntarily was flop over on the floor and try to get to some kind of safety he was like i couldn't control myself i was freaked out and i was like all right now i get it you know i was here <laughs> and i saw what you did except minus the teeth part and i said what did it what did the teeth look like and he said they were big block teeth and the canines were a little bigger than how humans present theirs you know and i was like okay how many did you see because not too long before this happened, like moments, like we just shut the door and he was standing next to me before he ended up under the table. And, you know, I started popping shots, but we just saw three sets of eye shine off in the tree line, like just right over there. He said, I only saw its teeth. I said, were there other ones looking in the window? He said, I only saw its teeth. So he couldn't get off the teeth thing. So I just left that alone and asked him, Hey, you know, can you pull yourself together here? Um, I don't know what's going on, but I need help. I can't defend us all and shoot every gun we got by myself. I need someone else here with me. He was like, no, I'm doing better. I'm going to, I'm going to change my clothes. I, I pissed myself. I said, well, let's hold off on that. You know, I, I wasn't trying to tell the guy what to do. It was still, this shit just happened. Let's, let's assess what's going on before we start, you know, uh, getting domesticated and worrying about what we're wearing you know I, I felt in danger like the the flight level in my mind was we should just go in the dark we should we should hit the we could hit the the bank of the river and follow the high bank down for a while swim across all this crazy shit was going on in my mind just to flee like i wanted no part of of making a stand or i mean defending myself yes but 
there was no way in my mind at that time I wanted to freaking be anywhere near where we were. All the fun and laughing of old oh, Harry Man, this and that, none, none of that. It was all deadly serious. Like there was no good feeling coming from the the pressure in the air. It was like an oppressive, uh, primal fear. This sense of dread that was so overpowering that if you if you didn't have a grasp of it immediately and and calm yourself down, you could very easily lose yourself in just utter fear and and the chaos of the mind going crazy about this. These eyes were huge. Um, in the window, this this figure we saw in the in the window, we couldn't make out much detail outside of the eyes because they were, were real bright. They weren't glowing themselves, but the the refracted light from them was really kind of cool because the lamp was dull. It wasn't very bright because it was still kind of dusk outside, but it was just so bright, like glowing, but just from the ambient light of the lamp. Anyway, it was just those things stand out in your mind, little things you just, in those situations, you just hold on to. Well, I don't know exactly how much time had gone by. Uh, there was this, there was this nail, the 16 penny nail and a rock. And this was a bent nail. My cousin's down on his knees, straightening this nail. Now the, the shack we're in has a little J hook to close the thing. No real lock, no real, there was no safety where we were none, no safety whatsoever. It was a glorified box. Well, he was trying to straighten this nail with this rock to nail the door shut. And I'm like, yo, dude, think about what you're doing. Come to, you know, snap out of it. There's no way that little nail is going to stop none of these things. I need your help. Focus on, on, let's get a game plan. We got to get out of here. You know, I was running ideas by him. Like maybe we can use a spotlight, get to the skiff and just get down river. You know, we were miles and, uh, Man, I don't remember exactly how far away we were from the nearest village, but it had to have been at least 60 to 80 river miles or better. Uh, and I'm that's being real conservative. We were way up in the middle of nowhere. I mean, literally. I'm trying to make plans and everything, and uh, time seems like it's going by in microseconds. Um, there'd be moments where it seems like everything's moving at a normal speed and then other times everything's just real slow motion almost it's hard to explain it's kind of like uh, if you've ever been seasick and that weird feeling of kind of feeling okay but then not okay and then feeling okay but then not okay it was it kind of ebbed and flowed like that well i'm i'm sitting here trying to explain to him look i shot at one of these things and i think i shot this thing I, I couldn't tell. I, sh I was shooting through the wall, you know, at the, the first time I opened up with the 12 gauge. I'm just shooting in the direction I think it would be according to how fast it was moving on and on, whatever. <clears throat> so I'm telling him this and uh, we're hearing weird noises off in the distance. Now, I'm, uh, I'm guessing about two, three hours have gone by at this point since... The whole place shifted in the scream and after I shot. So maybe four hours. It, it had been a, a, a minute. Um, I was trying to get my uncle to communicate. You know, he knew a lot of people upriver. He knew of all the, the little places and, oh, there's a trapper cabin over here where so-and-so lives. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of anything I can to uh, spark some kind of help from them other than you know, my cousin telling me he really wants to change his clothes. I get it. You know, I, I'm not happy with what's going on, but, y you know, whatever. At this point, go ahead, change your clothes. Y he didn't need my permission. We were just panic stricken. You know, nothing we were doing was making sense. So he's doing his thing and I'm trying to talk to my uncle and he's not really responding to me. Um, I'm like, you know, what, what can we do? Do you know of anything to scare these things away? You know, I'm looking for guidance of any kind. And he, he was just solemn, not a not a remark, not a 
not a comment. And that was very disheartening because, I mean, I love these people. It, it was just heartbreaking to see them broken. You know what I mean? Like just emotionally shot. They couldn't cope. You know, I, I was just glad my cousin was around mentally enough to be coherent enough to want to change his clothes and acknowledging, yeah, we're in danger because I wasn't getting none of that from my uncle. So I was feeling real alone. Well, as I'm talking to my uncle, uh, I'm telling my cousin at the same time, let's, let's get a game plan. Um, we can get into the skiff and let it drift. We won't make noise. We'll, we'll sneak out. We'll get down in the skiff. We'll, we'll drift down river. We'll just let the current take us and we'll be quiet until we get a ways away. And, you know, we can fire up the outboard and use spotlights to at least get down to the new Shigak river. No, no, can't do that too dark. Don't have enough lamp power, you know, flashlight power, yada, yada. So I'm like, look, work with me. We can't stay here. We're sitting ducks here. That's the only thing going on in my mind is if we stay here, we're going to die. Like, and it had nothing to do with me initially shooting through the wall. It was going on as soon as, like, it's hard to explain, but I felt in my, inside me when we saw that eye shine, when we initially thought it was a bear. At that moment, something deep inside me clicked, like, this is not this is not good. None of this is good. This is not normal. And it was that flight. Didn't want to fight, just wanted to flight. So all these things are going on. He's not giving me anything back. So we still got, uh, geez, at least a handful of hours before we start seeing light, the light of day. And I'm expressing this to them. I'm like, look, I need help here. We need to come up with something, get back to back, whatever we got to do and get the hell out of here. We can't just sit here. So they're both first light. We'll get out of here. I'm like, okay, well, just be ready at first light because I am not, I'm not loading up none of this shit up here in this shed. I'm taking the guns, the ammo, anything of importance, the rest of it. I don't give a damn. None of this stuff means nothing. You know, we'll maybe come back another time. But I ain't take I ain't gonna take the time to load the skiff. That's just not gonna happen. So they all agree. We're sitting there. Um, they start talking to each other. Um, and my uncle starts talking about the last fishing season, and I think he was just talking nervous talk, trying to change the subject, because um, he was bringing up you know how much salmon they caught in the best district and this and that just just small talk basically um trying to snap themselves out of the terror that was going on we're about two and a half three hours from full on light enough to see <clears throat> we decide hey maybe we can get down to the skiff before it's light drift until it is light and then fire it up and you know safely get out of there because at the mouth of the Nuya Cook, there's huge boulders, and we had a jet outboard and a regular prop drive outboard so that we could switch in and out for the lagoons versus the channel of the river for more power or whatever. But um, the gas, all our fuel, and the uh, spare outboard were down in the skiff. That was the only things down there was the outboard attached to the back, the one in the skiff, and all the gas. Everything else was up in the shed with us. So I'm laying it all out in my mind. What I think is best that we should do is uh, we'll spotlight around, see if there's anything going on, you know, anything nearby, make a break for it, jump in, kind of slip away in the dark. That was my idea. They're like, okay, it sounds all right. Um, you know, it's going to be hard to do in the dark because if we turn on a flashlight, they'll see it on and on you know we're having this debate going back and forth we decide we're going to take the spotlight and kind of beam out the one side the river side and see if there's anything kind of lurking watching us or whatever we beam over there nothing now behind this structure they had an outhouse that was roughly eight eight and a half foot tall uh they built it with minimum cuts to the wood 
just kind of like the lean to we were in but uh it, it wasn't big it was maybe you know uh, four foot square at most but it was about eight eight and a half foot tall i'm a carpenter so I, i'm pretty good with numbers it was obvious it was whole sheets that were you know cut for just a one-sided roof or whatever anyway so after we beamed the riverside we beamed the inland side and we started from the, the point of the direction where we saw the eye shine and uh which was on the opposite side of where this outhouse is but we're doing a sweep so there's no fence post markers or any eye shine from where we initially saw it so as we're panning around and over there was nothing until we get over to the outhouse and this thing behind it was freaking massive cartoon big uh, i'm telling you eh, blacker than black it's like it absorbed light uh just so big um gives me the ebgbs just thinking about it i get a little frog in my throat because it, it the size didn't scare me it was how it was absorbing the light there was it was just like the blackest black shadow but this thing was geez uh it, 13 plus feet tall at least at least five and a half feet wide massive cartoon big just hulking um we couldn't see any definition but you could it, it's no different than if someone drew a exaggerated arnold schwarzenegger in in black charcoal you can tell it had bulk and it was muscular you know what i mean and uh it moved like it started coming from behind that outhouse and that that spotlight went out immediately um oh, we all took back into that little camper shell area which like i said this place was no protection we're, we're so befuddled and just crazy with uh immediate fear like we were both shaking but we had barrels crossed i was pointing <laughs> towards one window he was pointing towards another and at the point of when we saw this thing move, I realized that we only have two 12 gauges and a 30 odd six, which is not enough. This thing, uh, this thing was massive, massive. Like, uh, uh, it was totally unreal. Uh, like, it was the most unreal, real thing I've ever seen. It, just humongous. Uh, thick as tree trunks everything on it was just big uh real long arms and it it like the way it moved was like it didn't walk it glided uh, it's hard to explain it just it was like this big shadow started moving so we took back in there we're we're freaking the f out like we can't we almost can't even um compose ourselves we're shaking trembling crying uh couldn't understand each other because we had so much snot running out our noses from the fear and just trying to trying to hold it together i remember thinking if i'm gonna have to pull this trigger i don't know if i'm going to be able to like it, the fear was so thick and hard it was real it, it was just horrible it was the single most horrifying traumatic thing i ever dealt with like and i've i've been shot at I've had a buddy, it, you know, I, I've seen some things, but this, I think it was more the nature of it, where it was happening and how it was happening that, that really just, it, it messed me up good for a, a few years after. But anyway, so we're sitting there, guns crossed, it gets deathly quiet. The pressure is back, like with a vengeance, you just, this oppressive pressure and fear was just it was just thick in the air so much tension we're just freaked out and uh it's deathly quiet we don't hear a noise we don't hear a movement deathly deathly quiet uh i don't know how long we sat there for a while with the barrels crossed and uh it had been quiet enough long enough still with that pressure in the air but we were able to to calm down enough and catch our breath and stop hyperventilating and, and communicate again. And uh, it boiled down to, we're getting the fuck out of here now. Like we're gonna, we're gonna make a go of it. 
you know, there's something real big out there that we, we just can't even, we ain't got nothing for it. We got no answer to it. we would got to go. So we're getting back to our original game plan, get down to the skiff. And it dawned on me, man, that skiff is tied off way back up on the bank. Like, you know, <laughs> we need to have a game plan to cut that rope. So I give him my pocket knife because he was going to go first. His dad, my uncle was going to follow behind me. And we were going to kind of cover each other on our way out. So that was the plan we were getting together. Now, it hasn't gotten any lighter. There's a, a slight change in the blackness. Just enough to where you can kind of make out the tops of the trees at a distance. But if that, I mean, it, it was still pretty damn dark. So we get our game plan together. And... We start hearing um, what to me sounded like rotor wash from a, a helicopter, a whoomp, 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 whoomp sound. And it was getting louder and faster, and we could start feeling it in the ground. Well, it wasn't a helicopter. It was one of these freaking things running by the building. It, the the sound we heard was its footsteps to thump 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 thump, but at a distance it sounded like rotor wash. Freaky shit, man. I mean, it went by the window so fast, and the only way we could tell it went by the window is because it was whatever it was was blacker than the blackness outside. So it went by whoop, and it wasn't the big one. Because that big one, we wouldn't have been able to see all of it in the window. It was too big. So this one ran by. Whoomp. A couple seconds later, we heard heard it again. This time it was different direction and a different one. So uh, we, we tried to make out. There had to have been at least three to four of different weights and sizes. Because you could feel it in the ground as they were doing laps around this building real fast. And, and running by. Like, it was almost like they would run off, line up, and then start again. You know, it, it just ebbed and flowed like that. Like, sheer terror. It was almost like they were feeding on our fear. It's hard to explain. It was like they were almost getting off on getting us. Because they could, this was a matchbox. They could have crushed this freaking place and smashed us against trees. Like, yesterday. No problem. I don't know why they didn't. That really messes with me to this day because these are intelligent beings they if if someone had just shot at me and i was capable of breaking the structure they're in and smashing them against a tree i would have done it you know anyway so this running continues on for about five ten minutes maybe a little longer it, we're, we're terrified again it hasn't really stopped being terrifying but like i said it was ebbing and flowing between white knuckle and you know, um, enough calmness to speak to each other with coherent sentences. Because for a while there, after initially seeing the big one, we couldn't even communicate with each other to like get words put together because we were so freaking out of it in fear. Like, I, I remember I, it was the hardest thing for me to light a cigarette because I didn't or to pump the lamp, I, I, I didn't want to let my hand off this gun. Like, I knew it wasn't enough gun, but I knew I didn't want to be without it. Because in my mind's eye, I kept seeing them just come through the wall. Like, I didn't know why they hadn't just flipped the place over, threw us in the river, and ended us. Because it, it would have been that easy for them. So that's why I felt they were, like, feeding on our fear. It's hard to explain. Um... <clears throat> so this goes on for a little while with the running around and uh we we just tucked back into that little camper area more and kept our heads down killed the lamp by this time um just to make sure you know so we could open fire on whatever looks in the window at us because we had it we determined that whatever looks in this window doesn't matter which side we're going to open up and we're going to keep shooting and, you know, we were just ready. We had that mindset. Well, nothing happened. Nothing happened. It got quiet again. And then it sounded like someone shooting a BB gun at this shed. 
they're small rocks. These things started throwing small rocks at the, at the structure. And like immediately it caught our attention. And, uh, someone had pointed out to me in recent past here, it may have been trying to get a head count on us, which makes sense. Cause we, we fell for it. We're like, what the hell is it? We started looking out, trying to look out the windows and stuff. Cause it was starting to get a little light in the distance, a little light off in the horizon. <clears throat> so, I mean, it literally sounded like a pellet, someone shooting a pellet gun against plywood. Plap, plap. We beamed out and we just saw the tiny little rocks uh, that were thrown at the, at the shack, the lean to right down on the ground. So that's how we determined it was rocks. Cause we thought maybe some local kids, we're fucking with us like as far-fetched at this point as it may have been it was a thought like oh well maybe this was all just a a ruse by someone that and we're just so panic-stricken we you know everything looked crazy but that wasn't the case these things were throwing the rocks um that went on for a while and then uh everything calmed back down and we tried looking for the big one again because my uh, all the other ones were huge way bigger than us, but there was something about that real big one that I was concerned about. Like I would rather deal with any one of the other ones than that one. Like that kind of feeling like the lesser of the evils, you know, I'll take that one. You get that one <laughs> kind of thing. So again, we're going up over our game plan. You got to cut the rope, uh, get in there, start the outboard while I'm coming down the, the little pathway because it's about it's not far from where we're at to the skiff it's about 20 feet to the edge of the bank and 10 to 12 foot like little sloping path kind of steep down to the river's edge not far it, it seemed like forever like 10 miles away at the time but we're getting all this put together in our mind and so it's getting a little darker or i'm sorry lighter um as the darkness is lifting, everything got real quiet. Like, no birds chirping or anything like that. Like, we would normally hear that time of day and that time of year out there. Just dead quiet. Um, the sun was coming up just enough to where we couldn't see it, but it was starting to hit the very tips of the the black spruce trees off in the distance and the lagoon off a ways away from us where we could see out the window. And, uh, I, I can't, I should have sent you a little hand-drawn map of what I'm talking about so it would make more sense to you. But anyway, <clears throat> there was a initial tree line, which was about 50 yards or so from the structure. And going downriver from the position we're at, it opens up into like a muskeg, like swampy muskeg, Alaskan muskeg, and then another tree line further away. <clears throat> so we were scanning to see you know where this big one went we saw nothing no eye shine it just this oppressive quiet so we're like okay now is our time there's enough light we can see don't need the flashlights we'll leave those uh my uncle got his little little day bag or whatever the hell it was fanny pack thing little miniature backpack looking thing uh i had a gun and bullets in my pocket that's that's all I that's all I wanted. We left all the gold panning stuff, all our food, all my new hunting gear I bought, new Coleman stove, lands, all that stuff, all this brand new stuff we just left. <laughs> well, we were leaving. We were in the process of leaving. So we talk it over. We get stacked up by the door. He's going to lead the way. I reiterated, hey, cut that fucking bow line, dude. If you don't cut that bow line, then, you know, someone else is going to have to do it. We may not have the time. I don't want to get down to the boat and have to mess with anything. I want to get in and go. So when you get down there, cut the bow line, start the skiff, and we'll go. He's like, yeah, yeah, I got it. I got it. I said, now, look, if we get out this door, I can't have you freezing up on me, dude. I can't. I can't do this alone. I, I can't have you freeze up, lock up, and hit the ground. I can't protect all of us. You know, like I said, my uncle, he, he wasn't some like disabled dude, but he, he wasn't spry, you know, <laughs> he was almost 70 at that time. So 
we get our game plan and it's time to go. So we go out the door and it's, it's dead quiet, not a sound, not a movement. Cause we, we went out the door real quick and then all of us, it's kind of comical looking back, but we all three stopped real quick. Like, like almost like we were ready to jump back inside kind of thing. And they kind of assessed looking around and there was nothing. So it was like a kind of quasi relief, like, okay. So he starts shuffling down over the trail. And at this point he has my 870 pump shotgun. I have the 30 odd six in my hand and I have my uncle's uh, like a wing master 12 gauge, old school, big ass, big ass 12 gauge slung over my shoulder or whatnot. Cause I wanted him to be as quick as possible because he was the, the weak link physically. <clears throat> so my cousin jets in front of us, he goes down, the, goes down to uh, start the skiff and whatnot. And I'm kind of, I'm not far behind him. I'm just like two steps behind him, kind of looking back, looking around. Cause I'm super paranoid at this point. My, my hair standing on end. Uh, I'm, I'm borderline about to freak out. You know, the, that overwhelming fear started getting, real strong again so i look down the bank there's nothing there uh he's safe at where he's at he starts cranking on the the outboard i wasn't paying attention uh i pause i turn around i tell my uncle come on come around me and watch yourself going down i don't want you to slurp you know slip and hurt yourself or whatever just a little pep talk like hurry it up kind of thing and I, if I hadn't took a step back to, to reposition myself, because this was right at the river's edge where there was a, an erosion line and the grass kind of hooks down onto the bank. It wasn't very stable area. So the way I leaned down to kind of help guide him down the little trail, uh, my foot kind of sunk in and it felt like the ground was given away there. So I kind of readjusted and moved back about half a step and I stood back up erect. And just as I was standing up to full height, this rock, bigger than a basketball, comes flying past me. Now, everything was in regular motion up until this point. Then it goes slow motion, like instantly. Uh, I saw this rock and my eyes just naturally follow it. And this thing was thrown with such force. I, I felt the air whisk by my face. But I also watched this thing impact the river. It had been at least three foot deep in the spot it hit. This thing hit with such force, it hit the bottom of the river before the river could flow back over it. It was like a big gaping wound momentarily, like a kabloosh. And then the water covered up the impact. It was crazy. So immediately my head whips towards the tree line. I'm getting the hard chills. Give me a second here. Okay. <laughs> so, the big black one is coming out of the trees, uh, roughly 50 yards away. Um, and this thing just tried to take me out. If, if I hadn't, if I would have just stood up where I was, I, I wouldn't be making this, having this conversation. Um, I immediately... Even though I was in fear, I had a rage in me like, you m girl, okay. Well, I had a 30 odd six. It's, it's not a, a lightweight gun. I've killed everything in Alaska with that. Coastal brownies, moose, you name it. I've dropped it with a 30 odd six, no problem. <laughs> so, everything's still slow motion. I turn, and this is a bolt action. I shot so fast. Like these three shots were, it sounded like a semi-auto. I'd never worked in action that fast in my life. Now, when I started opening fire, this thing was moving. It was like gliding. You couldn't make out physical walking. There was no bobbing. There was not, it was just gliding out. And uh, I couldn't, it was so black. I couldn't make out uh, like it's how it was moving. It was just, it seemed like it was gliding. So I put the three shot center mass. I mean, boom, boom, boom. I'm a good shot. I was raised subsistence. I, I shot my first moose ever with this same 30 odd six. This, this 30 odd six has been in the family forever. Like it was the, the rifle most of us got our first, first moose with because it was reliable. It was accurate. 
And it was a workhorse. It was just a solid rifle. So I nail this thing three times. It, it doesn't flinch. It stops coming forward, but it doesn't flinch. So now my, my inner fight or flee is on overdrive. It's time to go. I get down. He didn't cut the bow line. So I'm like, shit, throw me the, throw me the knife. He's got the outboard running. And he throws a knife. Luckily, it landed real close to me. I notice my 870 pump is on the ground. So what I'm guessing happened, because I never got a straight answer from him, was once he got on the skiff, since his dad didn't have a gun, he threw the shotgun out off the bow right there on the gravel for his dad to have access to. It was the only thing I could come up with. Because, I mean, anyway. So he throws a knife. I cut the bow line. And I'm, uh, I'm, he's got the engine revving too high for it to shift, right? And I'm like, hey, hey, idle down, idle down. They're coming, idle down, calm down, idle down so it'll shift. And uh, my uncle's trying to sit on the skiff and swing his legs in. And I I wasn't trying to be mean, but I shoved him. I like, this ain't a pleasure cruise kind of thing. I flung him into that skiff. I was like, get the in there, dude. You know, this ain't, yeah, I feel bad now. But at the time, I didn't, you know, he was going to make it in one piece. And we were getting the hell out of there. So I get the, the bow lines cut. Uh, I was turning to grab the shotgun or something. Everything went slow motion at this time since the rock went past me. So I'm still in hyper holy shit mode. And uh, he gets it to shift. And I, uh, my uncle, where I flung him in, he had kind of bruised his wrist pretty bad. But he shifted himself around and was facing back towards the bow of the skiff where I was. And, uh, at that moment, my uncle or my cousin at the outboard, uh, he looks up and his eyes get real big and all the blood drains from his face. And my uncle, where he repositioned in the skiff, he fell backwards more. So I looked back over my shoulder and holy shit, this thing it was the big black one. It was massive. It, it was on the bank just above me. And I just put shots on this fucking thing. You know what I mean? Like, and I wasn't in a place where I could shoot more. I, it was time to go kind of thing. But what really caught my attention was, even though it was pitch black, it had like amber red tips to the hair. It's kind of hard to explain. Um, it really stands out. And all I could focus on was its freaking shin, its shin area. Um, just because of freak out mode, my, I had tunnel vision so hard, it, it's hard to explain. So I push off. We, uh, he, he backs up. There was no movement from this thing. Nothing else being thrown. He puts it in forward gear, and we start skiffing down the river. Now, uh, we're not up on step yet. We're, we're just kicking along. Uh, one of the the outboard that we were using was the jet drive, and it doesn't have as much torque as the prop drive. And at this point, it didn't matter. It was running, but the jet had issues with its intake boot getting jammed up real easy with, you know, little pieces of grass or gravel or whatever. It was an older model. But uh, it was kind of hesitating when we were getting up on the step. So it was taking a second to really get the skiff moving. But I remember looking up towards the bank and kind of back over my shoulder. The, it, the big one was no longer there. Um, but one of the smaller ones was running alongside of the riverbank. Now, this is, it's about six, seven feet high bank on that side where it was. And it was probably a good 30 feet back. But you could see its head moving amongst the trees and, you know, it, it, it was cruising. So that really put a, they're hunting us kind of feel to it. Like they're, they're going to try to cut us off at the pass kind of feeling, which uh, at this point it was like, you know, all these things we'll, we'll, we'll shoot every single one that we can kind of attitude. I had anyway, uh, my uncle wasn't saying nothing and my cousin was just working to keep us moving. So what ends up happening is, is I, uh, 
I, I left my shotgun on the on the bank there. We left all that expensive shit, gold panning material, brand new hunting stuff, left it all there. We got out of there with whatever my uncle brought, uh, the 30 odd six, his shotgun, and the kicker and the gas and the clothes we had on our back. Because <laughs> when we were going back down the New Yakuk at this point, um, I was yelling back at my cousin saying, hey, hey, they're trying to follow on the high bank. You know, they're trying to follow. Where's the other rounds for the 30 odd six? There was four shots in it. I just shot three. So there's one more in it. Um, had his uh, my uncle's game master or wing master 12 gauge was like a big 28 or 32 inch barrel. Just a big it, it was a gun, though. You know, I wasn't knocking it. It just wasn't what I wanted. I wanted more rounds for the 30 odd six. And uh, uh, we couldn't we couldn't find the ammo at the time. So we only had one round in that. And so I got the, the Wingmaster shotgun. And thankfully, n there was no further um, sightings or attempts to get at us at that point. Uh, we were able to skiff on down. Uh, we made it to the Nushigak probably close to midday. Now, we were way, I don't know if you got Google Maps, you can look at it yourself. It, we were way the hell out of in the middle of nowhere. And we had just started a journey with, uh, luckily enough gas to get us to Kaliganik, but, uh, we were basically no food, no nothing, uh, probably a day and a half river trip from Kaliganik. And it, it was just, it was hard to deal with at the time. Like I drank pretty heavy after that for a couple of years. Um, just, just dealing with it, the, the, it was so surreal. Like, I don't fear going out in the woods, uh, even to this day, but when I get a feeling, I, I've, I know what that feeling is and I know what's causing it. So like, it's almost like my own self-protection kind of thing. If I get an eerie feeling in the woods, I don't care what I'm doing. It's time to go. I don't care what kind of hardware is around. I don't care who's got what gun or what we're doing. It doesn't matter. We got to go because it, it just. It didn't feel like there was enough gun, you know, especially for that big one. I, I I can't think of a single outside of maybe a 50 cal big heavy round to even want to start something with it, you know, because it did, when I shot this thing, it didn't flinch. Like you couldn't even what was real creepy is there was uh, it was all pitch black. You couldn't make out facial features. All you could make was a silhouette. So it was like this emotionless uh gonna kill you machine uh, it's hard to explain but yeah it it was by far the scariest most uh, like this was 15 years ago this happened in 2006 like i still get the ache in my gut and my hair standing on end no different than the day it happened yeah, man, that story gave me goosebumps. Well, what's messed up is is these relatives of mine that I love, they won't even talk to me about it. Like, like sharing it is a form of uh, healing from it, I guess. You know what I mean? Like, get it off my chest kind of thing. Because even talking about it, I, I realize I, I still have a lot of pent-up emotion about it. Like, it, just telling you about it just now, there's a couple times I felt like I wanted to just cry because it was just so... Uh, surreal so did you ever return back to the area to grab your belongings oh hell no 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 nope none of it meant nothing I was, in my mind it was like good luck gold panning hairy man have at it have my shot i don't give two two dams about that gun or any of it since then i've wanted to go back to that area just because of my morbid sense of curiosity and kind of you know, a few years back when the big hunt for Bigfoot thing came into more popularity, because all this happened pre anything really mainstream about the hairy man or anything, you know. <clears throat> but I've thought about it since, and like part of me is like, yeah, maybe I'll go get one, you know, bring one in. And then the other part of me is like, hey, you're stupid. And what are you thinking? Just remember the last time you shot at one of these things, what happened? You know, that kind of thing goes through my mind. It's like, uh, 
so I'm kind of torn, you know, I want to, I want to go back out and maybe, you know, look at some stuff or maybe, you know, obtain some more concrete evidence for people. But another part of me is like, ah, stay at home, man. <laughs> don't, don't do it. Well, one of the creepiest things is the following year in 2007, um, I was going with, uh, two of my other, we got a very large family up here. Um, I was going with two other of my cousins from Dillingham to New Stuyahawk. <laughs> we were going to do, I, I don't remember exactly. It's all kind of a fog. We were heavy drinking back then. Um, it had been a little less than a year since this experience happened that I just told you about. And so I'm on high alert. Uh, we still have no, <laughs> we were so dumb. But we didn't have any different firearms. I mean, my, my one cousin had a, a 30 odd six, but he had a, a 10 round box mag and a real good gun, you know, but just not enough. I had the same 30 odd six I had the year before. And the other relative that was with us, he had this little 243, this little nothing rifle for Alaskan game. I mean, you shoot caribou with it or whatever. But, uh, so we were on our way up to New Stuyahawk because my aunt just married into a family up there and we're, we're doing something out that way. I don't remember exactly. It was in the fishing season. Everyone was flush with cash. We had a bunch of beers and some whiskey and shit. We were going to have a good time. So we leave Dillingham a little late and it was just happened to work that way with the tide because the mouth of the Nushigak is a tidal area. I'm not sure if you're familiar with it, but when the tide comes in, it'll push the fresh water up and raise the water level. And then when it goes out, you can get stuck on a sandbar if you're not careful, that kind of thing. <laughs> so we made it past a little obstacle course by Black Bluff and Angel Bay. And we're still miles and miles and miles from New Studio Hop. Ekwok isn't as maybe four and a half miles from where we ended up banking on the river's edge because we couldn't, it was getting too dark. And uh, so we saw a good stand of trees a uh, little bit of a higher bank and an open area to where we felt comfortable setting up a little camp until it got light and then continue our trip well when we banked up we noticed there was a bunch of uh, beetle killed spruce so my first thought is hey we'll grab chainsaw we'll, we'll get big ass bonfire going and just whoop it up you know some indians out in the woods you know having a good time so we had this bonfire going and uh <laughs> we had been there a few hours. I hear this owl hoot off in the distance. It sounded natural at, you know, maybe 80, 100 yards. Just, hoo, 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 hoo. I was like, oh, and it, nothing that really stood out. You know, you hear owls periodically, you know, out that way. And uh, everything changed a moment later when behind us, up in the, up in the hills behind us, probably a uh, little over 100 yards, maybe more. We heard another owl hoot, very loud and very unnatural. It was an owl imitation. So immediately, uh, that's where we're from. We knew immediately all is not good. So we just decided, okay, we're gonna we'll, we'll stoke the fire bigger and we'll keep a better look because there wasn't much we could do. We we're stuck on the riverbank. We couldn't navigate in the dark. There's just is way too dangerous. <laughs> now, grant you, it's not pitch black yet, but it was too dark for us to try to make a go of it by river. Well, after the one behind us hooted across the river, directly across from us, and at this point, the river is about 75, 85 yards wide. And on the far bank, the tree line was good 50 to 80 feet back. <clears throat> there was another out hoot that came from that stand of trees over there. Now, like I said earlier, I'm into competition stereo, so I know loud. I know what loud is, you know what I mean? Like the loud you could feel from a distance. This thing hooted so loud, I, I felt it in my pant legs. Like, I, I can't even imagine uh, the lung capacity it took to do that. It, it was just, it was amazing. Honestly, it, it was very amazing at how intense it was and how powerful it was. So right after that hoot, we're all immediately stoking the fire, getting this thing rip roaring, right? I mean, it got so hot. The little pop-up tent we had, a good 12 feet away or a little better, 
uh, it melted one of the guidelines and melted part of the tent. That's how hot we got it going. <clears throat> so we're during this time as we're stoking this fire and getting guns close to us and taking a shot of whiskey to calm the nerves kind of thing. Like, oh man, what's going on here? Cause we didn't really, it was strange, but nothing ominous yet. Well, where the original hoot came from, we heard another hoot, closer, louder, and not natural sounding. Then again, behind us, a little closer this time, same thing, hoot. Then across the river, we heard it again, a hoot. But out of view, because we were kind of on a bend of this river, and just out of our view, we heard this thing run and go through the river i don't know if it jumped most of the way across in the shower i don't know how it happened but we heard kabloosh 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 this is a nushigak river man this is not a little stream kind of thing you know what i mean it's it's a it's a river and uh so immediately we're we're all on edge um we heard this thing splashing in the distance and uh, where we guesstimated it came out of the river we heard another hoot real loud but with this click chirping going on with it so you had the hoot hoot and then this kind of like almost like a tongue popping kind of sound it, real fast almost like a almost like a woodpecker woodpecking against a tree if that makes sense so you had this combination of owl hoot unnatural owl hoot real loud with this clicking and then the other two sound off doing the same thing, right? So we get back to back. Um, there's about 30 to 40 foot distance between the tree line we're camping at and the river's edge where we had the boat banked. We're sitting there and we're kind of joking around. I was like, oh, great. You know, it didn't get me last year. So now I got you idiots with me. It's definitely going to get me this time. You know, that kind of trying to lighten the mood and not allow ourselves to get so freaked out <clears throat> so the hooting continues loud and all all of them are sounding off with the clicking again so it went from just hooting to hooting with this clicking this click popping um kind of like you know that movie the predator where there's that kind of like a cat purr but more click to it it was kind of like that along with it but not necessarily a growl uh, it's hard to explain it was on so many different octaves at once um it was very confusing uh i noticed that because each time we had heard it from the different areas and each time we heard it it they were they were moving in on us um there was no doubt so we, we were immediately talking about hey look we're being hunted uh let's let's go you know we'll we'll just drift from here because we were on the uh, channel side of the river we're on the high bank so if we were to cut loose even if we couldn't see the river would just kind of spit us out you know what i mean so that was going to be our game plan of getting the getting hell out of there um while we're sitting there talking uh my one cousin with the little small rifle the 243 he goes over to the tent and the only thing we had in the tent at this time uh, was just a, a bag with the, the beer and alcohol. It was a small duffel bag. So <laughs> for him, that was the most important thing, I guess, because he, he ran over there, grabbed that, and uh, was coming back towards us. And we're kind of standing up, looking around, seeing if we could see anything, because we had this bonfire going. We couldn't get too close to it because it was so hot. But we had it going so hot and, and bright. We were trying to see if any of these things were looking at us from the tree line. You know, maybe have a, a shot at one of them or something because we were we were feeling a buzz at this time. You know, we're we had a little bit of bravery kicking up because of the alcohol, the whiskey kicking in. But at the same time, we were real apprehensive, like uh, we were making jokes about the next guy being a sissy just to make ourselves feel better, trying to trying to lighten the mood and, and, and play it light because it was just this ominous feeling. And as he was coming with the duffel bag over back by us, we heard a rustling. 
uh, couldn't have been 25 feet away from us in the light that we should have been able to see whatever was making this noise because it it happened between where the skiff was at the riverbank and the tree line. It, it was in the open. The, the sound was originating in this open area, and it sounded like footsteps, pump, 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 with the leaves and the little alder scrub brush uh, rustling around. Couldn't see anything moving, not even leaves moving because – when we heard that initially all guns were pointed that way and uh immediately my thought was don't get distracted make sure we look around us you know don't just look in one direction they could be distracting us and the other ones could be doing something hokey throwing rocks or whatever you know it felt like an ambush like uh they were gonna get us <clears throat> so i start looking around there's nothing we can't see anything there's nothing to shoot at there's nothing to even um feel like you could defend yourself we're, we're just three guys standing in the open with the duffel bag of booze and some guns at this point so you know we we're like okay well the, the noise is between us and the skiff now so let's all together kind of shuffle together in a little group past whatever's making that noise hopefully it's just a noise and we're tripping because we're on high alert at this time we're, we're like borderline freaking out so we shuffle on over to the skiff. We get down in there. We untie the line from the, the scrub brush we had it tied off to. And we push off from the bank. And uh, it's a good current there. So no sooner than we, we, we clear the bank, we're immediately sweeping down river. Um, just before our fire got out of our sight, um, my one cousin that grabbed the alcohol, he decided he'll throw the anchor. We'll anchor out in the channel where we'll be safe. Sound like a good idea. Throw the anchor. Maybe with the fire off in the distance, we can see them move and, and shoot at their silhouettes. You know, we're feeling brave at this point because we, we got away. We're ready to pop some shots at these things. But where we ended up, where the anchor finally caught was just below where we could see the fire itself but we could see the light from it on the trees around. And <laughs> from our vantage point, you could see shadows move, like from the firelight. Nothing that you can make out, but just big shadows move. And then you heard stuff, and then all of a sudden, um, heard this loud scream, and some of the fire logs were flung into the river. It, real weird. Uh, the sounds that were coming from that area were just... If if we could have recorded them, we could have sold them to a, a horror movie picture show for for background noises. They were so demonic sounding, so evil. Like it sounded evil, like the most demonic growl, yelps, howls that you could even imagine were coming from that area. And uh, once that happened, I was like, look, let's pull the anchor. Let's drift the fuck further away from here, dude. Like, we're still too close. This, I don't, I don't, no, no. Let's go. Let's just pull up the anchor and let it drift us down to where we can, you know, uh, be in a deeper channel and not worry about running aground and, and just head back to Dillingham. So that's what, that's what we ended up doing. <laughs> but yeah, just some of the eeriest, creepiest, like, I don't want to make it sound like every time you go out, oh, you're going to be accosted and confronted by these things. That That's not it. There's just certain areas up there that you are more than likely going to be accosted by one. I, I think it has to do with the lack of people around and their curiosity. I think they're drawn to us just out of curiosity. And then then I feel they come uh, become territorial once they see, you know, who's there then they you know that's what i feel anyway so the sasquatch in alaska are a lot more aggressive than the sasquatch in the lower 48 right from what i surmise i've, I've heard a lot of stories of people down there gifting and this and that and i i i can't i personally i, I don't i wouldn't uh, there's nothing that i've dealt with that makes me feel warm and fuzzy like all i've ever had happen was predatory behavior a hunting type behavior like they were closing in on us man you know at each and every encounter they initiated it they pushed it 
I, I don't know. Grant you, I, I was popping shots, but I, I was provoked. <laughs> it wasn't like I just decided, oh, I'm going to start taking shots. It was, you know, in defense. Have you heard of any positive encounters from around the village? Uh, none, none of a happy nature. It always involves, uh, like there's a couple missing kids right now in New Studio Hawk. Um, this, this was a few years ago now, but a lot of these missing people, especially from remote places, they will chalk it up to alcohol death. Even though there's no sign of the body, there's no autopsy or anything. They'll just chalk, oh, young kid, liked to drink, went off alone, got drunk in the woods, disappeared. Okay, fair enough. Sometimes I'm sure that happens. But there's just there's too many missing people in this state for it to just be one thing or another. I'm not saying it's all you know, Sasquatch. But I firmly believe from my own personal experience, there's at least some that go missing because of these things. And and I'm going on anecdotal evidence, uh, uh, things I've experienced myself. Like I've met people and I've tried to tell them this and they were like, oh, you're full of shit. You didn't see nothing but a bear. And I'm like, look, <laughs> I'm Alaskan native. I was raised with coastal brown bears around me all the time. I'm from like... Katmai National Park isn't far from where I grew up. You know, I know brown bears. I hunted, I did bear control for Electnigic Village in the early 90s. I know what a bear is. These are not bears. You know, these are, <laughs> these are big <laughs> that aren't friendly. You mentioned the Sasquatch moved the building. How much did it move? A couple feet at least. Like, I thought they were going to push us in the river. Like, I... Grant, uh, part of me wanted to go back and check out how much was disturbed from when we got there, but I was so freaked out for the longest time going back there in any near future from when it happened wasn't going to happen. Uh, I was too freaked out. Yeah. And the amber colored eyes that you saw through the window, can you describe the diameter and how far apart they were? Uh, they were probably a foot apart and at least the size of small uh, teacup saucers. Like at a distance, I thought these things were um, postmark reflectors, those big round ones. And this head in the window took up most of what, no, these little windows in this shack were only uh, 18 inches tall and 24 inches wide. They were just little, I think they came from an old school somewhere up river and they were just thrown into this little shack. It was nothing. There was no internal skinning or anything. It was just on the outside was five eighths two uh, plywood and two by four uh, construction, and the floor itself was a bunch of old pallets with like OSB screwed down to it. Okay. And what what exactly did you see in the window other than the eyes? Is that all you saw was the the outline and the big eyes glowing? Uh, no, this, this one had the facial features of like, uh, the, the skin tone was like, uh, an ash gray, um, looked like, uh, an old Native American. You see those old pictures of a chief, you know, wide, big cheekbones, uh, inset eyes kind of thing. It had that kind of look with the ash gray, but the nose, uh, instead of being pronounced was more flattened to the face but had nostrils like us but just wider spread um the hair it was almost like from where you have the smile lines next to your nose that come down to your mouth from that point it was like hair hairless around the cheekbone up onto the uh, forehead it was the only place it didn't have this uh, it wasn't fur uh but this hair was it was denser in the face. It looked like a real full mustache kind of bearded look with the couldn't make out the full jawline, but the, the lower part of the head was wider than the upper. Yeah. So you feel like they didn't want you in the area. I mean, that's a given, correct? Yeah. Oh, not at all. Mm. Not at all. From from initially when when I saw it over his shoulder, I didn't I couldn't make anything else out but a dark shadow moved. And the movement caught my attention because the place just shifted a little bit and there was no wind. You know, we're right on the river 
when the wind blows earlier that day, when it was breezing a little bit, you heard a little bit of a creak, but it pushed against it. It almost felt like it was feeling it out looking back on it, but I'm just speculating at this point. <laughs> yeah. But it, whatever Can it had to have punched the... down. Mm-hmm. Oh, I'm sorry, okay. I wasn't trying to cut you off. I was just saying it had to have hunched down to look in the window at us. Yeah, no, that's what I was going to say is, can you describe the, the movements and the gliding motion? Uh, fluid, <laughs> very fluid, like uh, the big the big one. It, it moved like, you know, those old movies where Dracula's coming out of the fog and he's just kind of gliding. It, it was almost like that effect, but without the fog. Uh it was so pitch black you couldn't you couldn't make out any detail and its size was one thing but the fact that beaming it with this spotlight it was still pitch black like it wasn't giving nothing back you couldn't make anything anything out on it it was like it was absorbing the light creep that creeped me out uh, still just getting the chills thinking about it the size was definitely scary as shit but something about it absorbing the light it just made you feel like death is right there and it's coming for you like you're not going to escape this blackness kind of feel can you describe the the pressure feeling i kind of described it before in some other episodes it's kind of like when a tornado is coming every like all the air that that is a good analogy uh the air goes deathly still um i got goosebumps thinking about it uh the the pressure almost felt like you could uh tension in a room like if you've ever been in a situation where there's two arguing parties that just got quiet and there's that that pent-up tension you know because everyone's holding their tongue kind of thing it's like that on steroids like um oppressive not just a feeling but it's like a, a a pressure that's pushing in on you it's oppressive it's like being forced upon you this this primal fear yeah i've heard other people talk about it and it's just kind of like a gut instinct like we're hardwired to know that when these things take place something isn't right yeah like i was saying i was speaking to that a little bit when we saw the eye shine like there was no movement from the eye shine when we looked out the door but the something i'm getting the chills thinking about something just was unnaturally wrong like it wasn't your run-of-the-mill oh there's a bear out there kind of situation even if it was an aggressive bear been there done that i never felt that way about a bear we used to go we were so dumb we used to go we used to on bear control if we shot a wounded bear and it didn't drop in the uh in the dump where we were uh told to get the biggest boars we could and we had to track it at all we we didn't fear that it we didn't didn't get those these kind of feelings from even that kind of situation tracking an injured brown bear into the woods it was a an unreal oppressive fear it was almost like it was being projected on us like and at one point it looking back on it it felt like they were feeding on our fear like when they were running around and and all that stuff it, it really felt like they were doing it to get a reaction out of us. So do you feel like the more frightening the situation became, the more active the Sasquatch became? That's what it seemed like. Now, understand, this was all uh, under duress. <laughs> it was under some of the highest forms of stress. That I've uh, Actually, the highest stress I've ever dealt with. Um, I'd been out on the Bering Sea with huge rolling waves, ice buildup, all that was nowhere near as scary or as intimidating or life-threatening as this felt. Yeah, it could have been that they were feeding off of that. They could sense that from you guys. Kind of like when something runs from a predator, it's instantly going to chase them. You know, they could have sensed your energy and just kept it rolling. Yeah, because I'm telling you, it, it was... The the thing that stands out the most to me was the feelings I ended up having towards these family members of mine. Like, I love these people. I grew up with them. I, I, I got a photo album downstairs with them in it. Like, the, these are family. But in those moments, I felt like 
which one of these assholes am I going to shoot to get out of here safely? You, you know what I mean? Like I, I was getting to a point of fear to where it was like, they're not helping me. I'm it's me myself. If they're not willing to help me, well then them kind of but forgive my language. I'm just being honest with you. I felt that way. I felt in moments, it wasn't that way the whole time, but I would get little pockets of emotion that I, I felt that way. And, and then I kept getting this feeling of, make a break for it. You can make it. You can get to the skiff yourself. If they don't want to go, screw them. They, they know what's going on. They can see, you know, that those kind of things are going through my mind. And that's not me. You know, I, I love my family. I, I would fight for them. But in this situation where they weren't acknowledging what was going on or, or it, it, it's hard to explain. Yeah, their mind went uh, blank. I've had that situation happen before to me when one pushed down a tree across the river and then screamed at us behind from behind mm. trees. And, you know, my ex was telling me, grab the gun, grab the gun. And I'm smiling and kind of looking one way and like looking at her half ass smiling. And I just couldn't process what was going on because. <laughs> right. It gets a little too surreal and like, whoa. Yeah. yeah and I know what you mean. It's. It, it totally shifts your paradigm. Like, okay, I grew up knowing these things existed. I've seen them at a distance. I've heard screams, yells with within close proximity. You know, I've seen their silhouette in the brush and then them run off and break a tree or whatever. Um, we even saw one one time uh, we were four wheeling. Uh, we were coming back from uh, Manicotic Twin Hills on an old snow machine trail on these four wheelers. And uh, we were coming across this muskeg between tree lines. And, uh, my cousin in front of me um, hit a, a deep spot in his on his quad and kind of sunk down to where we we're going to have to pull him out. So we ended up stopping and uh, my cousin behind me and uh, a family friend that was with him got my attention saying, look, look. And over to our right in the middle of the muskeg, probably 100 yards from us out in the middle of the open was a hairy man. And it was making a tree knocking sound with its mouth like they sound like two louisville sluggers banging each other pop just that classic wood knock sound but it was making it with its mouth it wasn't hitting no tree it had no branches in its hands it was standing there and it that was that was creepy because one <laughs> uh the quad was stuck and we're all in a train line basically because it was the safest part of the muskeg to cross because there are some deep spots that where if your quad goes through the muskeg, you ain't getting it back, you know, or whoever goes with it. So we're, we're on a pretty uh, tight trail. So we're kind of stuck while he's stuck. And this thing is 100 yards is pretty far. But in this situation, it wasn't far enough because we had some handguns with us. But it wasn't we, we didn't go every excursion out worried about the herring net. You know what I mean? Because, yes, there's encounters and things happen over the years, but it wasn't like a, a constant. But when it did happen, um, it got real, real fast. Because once it was uh, done making the tree knocking sound, we're all just awestruck. There must have been eight of us total. Uh, there was like five or six quads, a couple double rides, you know, two riders on one. And... Uh, once this thing stopped making the knocking sound and we we're all talking amongst each other, uh, one of our uh, family friends was like, should we shoot it? You know, with his uh, native accent. <laughs> and uh, another one of my cousins, it, it's funny in hindsight, but at the time he was like, don't be dumb. You're dumb. And uh, it, I kind of chuckled and <laughs> I was like, someone you know does anyone got a camera because uh, a lot of us had those little fuji film little uh, disposable cameras we used to use those a lot because <laughs> we didn't cell phones weren't prevalent back then whatsoever um but we were just talking about that and then it started running um the same direction it was heading parallel to us but off into in front of us and when it took off running this thing was so fast like um it looked like a jet boat rooster tail from all the water uh, when it was running across the muskeg that it was kicking up behind it. It looked like a rooster tail coming from a jet boat. It was running so fast. Just 
and just so loud. It, I mean, it was, it had to have been weighed over a thousand pounds. <clears throat> and that one looked like a uh, Chewbacca, but twice the size, broader shoulders. And if you lowered the head more onto the chest than the shoulders, it had that kind of look to it. Real long, amber, kind of like orangutan looking hair. So they all look a little different. Yeah, I've never seen two that look alike. I've seen two that look similar. Um, like the the Native American look with the flat nose. I've seen a couple look like that. Um, seen a few that look more like Patty at a distance. Um, then I've seen little black ones, real small, uh, less than six foot. They kind of had a real pointy looking head. Um, I saw a group of about five or six of those one night we were, let's see, we were coming down the Wood River from Aleknagek and it, we were just above where those, uh, Sorensen scows were from, uh, what I was telling you earlier, all, all this stuff transpired in the same geographical area, a very large area, grant you, but it, it was all from the back home as i call it um we saw them in the tree line as we we're drifting down river uh they tried throwing some sticks at us but i guess they couldn't find anything big enough but they ran along the river bank um up until my brother started popping shots at them uh because it was like uh it didn't seem real at the time it was like well look at that you know what is that we're all looking and there's literally five or six of them like hopping along and making this weird kind of chatter sound. It was hard to make out because of the sound of the outboard in the river. So once we saw them, we killed the outboard and we're just drifting, kind of checking it out because it was everything was surreal. It was like, what is this? Because at first it was hard to make out. It almost looked like some black bear cubs kind of prancing and flipping and messing around. But <clears throat> once we started really focusing, you could you could tell that they were uh, they were less than six foot tall. They were all about the same height, real pointy heads, almost like uh, I heard somewhere someone explained uh, that Disney movie Tarzan, where Rosie O'Donnell's uh, gorilla character kind of had that that swoop to the top of the head, yeah, like the curl of the... hair. Yeah, the conical shaped head. Yeah, exactly. It was like five or six of those looking little things, but humanoid um real long arms real weird sounds they were making not like the normal owl hoots or um screams or anything this was like a a real garbled chatter couldn't make it out <clears throat> but yeah it, that i was focusing on them trying to figure out what exactly i was looking at when my brother opened up <clears throat> he didn't hit any of them but as soon as he started shooting, everyone kind of snapped out of there. Oh, shit. And uh, my other cousin fired up the skiff again. And everyone was on the same kind of page of let's get the hell out of here. Yeah. So let me ask you this question. In Alaska, do you guys carry rifles all year round? And like, do you guys hunt pretty much all year round? Uh, yeah. I mean, for the most part, yeah. Yeah. Back home, when you're living remote, you don't go anywhere without a gun. You just don't. Like, yeah. um, so you hear in the lower 48, I mean, we have seasons just like you guys, but there's only like specific times that there's people actually out there with rifles. And you may have people that, you know, carry one around their property or whatever, but normally people don't have guns on them when they're using the forest around here in Missouri. You know, they're either hiking or kayaking, but down there in Ala or up there in Alaska, if you go out on a boat, you're going to bring your gun. You know, if you go deep in the forest, you know that you might encounter a grizzly bear. So you're going to have oh, that. Even on a day hike, even on a day hike, um, yeah. my little brother, he'll, he'll bring either his pistol AK or his, uh, 10 mil Glock or something that is more than just a little, you know, nine millimeter or something like that. Yeah, for sure. So it seems like, the Bigfoot in the lower 48 are more used to people and they've kind of grown around generations of humans and have gotten more adapted to them. But up there in Alaska, yeah, I mean, it seems like yeah. they're not used to people. 
I mean, so, most of these areas are extremely re- remote, and nobody really goes up there. No, you might get some flying fishermen that'll land on the Agulawak River or at one of the lodges up there or whatnot. And <clears throat> but no, it's few and far between, and the seasons are so short that. Uh, those who can afford to go to those kind of places, there's not many of them and they're not there for very long. You know what I mean? So it's like a very short window of time. Now, I used to know uh, a couple of the uh, uh, caretakers of the lodge, uh, the Mission Lodge on the Wood River and the Nushigak Lodge up on the Nushigak River, which are closer to Dillingham versus way remote where uh, I had to fire on that one was. But uh, one of the caretakers, uh, had one come into his campfire light and he quit that night. Like he'd just been there two days. <laughs> he told me about this at the Dillingham airport when I was picking up a cousin of mine. Cause uh, it was, it was fishing season. We were getting ready for hunting. And one of my cousins was coming in for the hunt. And uh, we just so happened to be talking about going up river. And he was like, I don't know if you know this place well, but we're from there. So we're, we're just listening to the stranger, you know, he's like, I don't know if you, you know what you're getting into. I, I just got a job up there caretaking this lodge and I was there two days and this damn Bigfoot came into my campfire and stared at me and uh, don't go there. Don't just don't go. And we kind of laughed and we're just because even people unaccustomed to it will have these experiences out there. You know, uh, there's countless. To, there's a guy named Joe Active out of Bethel. He keeps track of a lot of stories. I've been trying to kind of back channel and get a hold of that guy just to get more info because outside of my anecdotal stuff I never really I, I'd hear people tell me their stories and whatnot but this guy really keeps track of some of the the more pertinent more credible stories outside of uh you know just a little oh I saw something big and brown off in the distance kind of thing he he keeps good track of stuff so I've been kind of trying to reach out to that guy and get some get some better information because i've been kind of contemplating like looking into things around here where i live now in the matsu valley but uh like even getting 911 calls for uh strange disturbances with strange critters and stuff is really hard because their computer system's all jacked up and i mean my older brother's a state trooper but even he can't you know access certain things so This is kind of one of those things, I guess. You mentioned you heard a chirping or clicking sound. Was that a vocalization that the bigger Sasquatches were making or the smaller ones? It was all of them. All of them in one form or another. Uh, It just so happened uh, we didn't see any of the the four at the, the bonfire site that were hooting like owls and making that sound. We didn't see any of them. But they were within range where <clears throat> they they were just outside of our, our sight, like before we got out of there. And then the one we couldn't see that we knew was right there, that was real freaky because there's no way we shouldn't have seen it. it. It was within 25 feet of us. Like we could hear the noise right over there on the ground. Like, And it wasn't just like a mouse going through some, some brush. It, it was heavy. When you guys were getting ready to leave the shack and you saw the large figure hiding behind the outhouse, what went through your mind? Like, no way. What the, uh, uh, it, it took a minute for it to even register what I was looking at. Like, uh, I, I immediately knew, but it, it was absorbing what I was looking at because it was so black, um, without any real definition outside of silhouette so it was uh it it was a form of panic and fear uh that i i can't even put into words uh it, it felt like the end like this is it you know it was almost like a like it almost made a person feel like they were just ready to lay down and give up like, okay, you, you know, it was that kind of feeling like, what can I do to this? You mentioned you started drinking after this encounter. How bad did this affect you? Oh, man. Um, I, I had drank occasionally and, and went on binners before this, but 
after that point, um, I, it affected me to where I lost a couple jobs because of it. Um, just, it, it got a lot heavier. My drinking did. That's for sure. Cause I was trying to self-medicate because those who I experienced it with that I was trying to communicate with to kind of talk it out, kind of make sense of it. Cause it, it was all just so friggin' freaky. Um, they weren't there. Like they wouldn't even acknowledge our trip. You know what I mean? Like, and I've tried to corner them after that on a couple different occasions. Like, Hey, you know, we need to talk about what happened. And they just like, like I, they didn't know what I was talking about. And that really, honestly, that pissed me off and made me feel even more alone about it. Yeah, that's understandable. So, and I understand being traumatized, but I was there. I was traumatized too. Like I didn't get away scot free. It's still like <sighs> talking about it helps, but there are still times periodically where I'll I'll wake up in a cold sweat, feeling like I don't have enough gun. Where, where's a bigger gun? Just out of the blue, you know. It won't. I know it's hard to explain. No, I understand. You know, some people will take these experiences and push them back in a place deep in their mind and lock it away and never talk about it again and that's kind of a way certain people deal with these situations right and one thing that helped me quit drinking so heavily i don't drink anymore at all but uh one of the things that helped me is i started telling people about it that didn't believe me i didn't care if they believed me i just needed to talk about it you know what i mean like uh, I would go out to the bar and shoot pool and just bring it up. And, and that helped, even though the people, <laughs> I'm sure they're like, oh, this loon, you know, this guy's nuts. But uh, I've never been a timid guy. I've, I'm not scared of anything or any man. I never have been. But there's something in those situations that's just so primal. Uh, like in 2018, I went remote up to Ruby off the Yukon River. And that you fly into a small remote village and then we went 50, 60 miles, even more remote. <laughs> I didn't have any, uh, encounters as I would call it, but I had some experiences to where I got that pressure. Now this is a small mining camp of about a dozen of us total big concrete pad or a uh, gravel pad. My apologies with some conix bands and heavy equipment. We had a D 10 cat, um, big, massive, mining equipment you know their trauma was down in the pit and all that but we were really remote and i went there as a carpenter to build them two new bunk houses they were 10 by 20 one-sided roof easy for one guy <laughs> well like the second day i was there i was out on this gravel pad alone because everyone else worked down in the pit you know they'd run the trauma and do whatever gold miners do and i was up on the pad by myself and i would get that pressure feeling periodically it wasn't constant but i i felt it enough times and i'm real keen to it since the experience in 06 and 07 um to go with that feeling i got so there was a couple days where i didn't even get a full day's work in because i felt that pressure i couldn't i, I just knew something was watching me i was there by myself everyone was down the hill in the pit so essentially I was by myself and I, I just got so creeped out a couple times. I just went into cab into camp, which was, uh, it was like four at co trailers all melded into one unit <laughs> that they used for their camp. And they had a couple of little outbuilding cabins for, um, some of the more senior, uh, equipment operators. But yeah, there's something about that pressure once you feel it and you, yeah. it's easy to pick up on. It's kind of like once bitten, you know, you, you kind of, you immediately, it's like muscle memory. Oh, get the hell out of here. You know, you don't want to, you don't want to stay here. So what do you think they are? Do you think there's some type of hominid or some type of primate living out in the forest? Well, I, I definitely think it, it's biblically related, but not in the sense of their actual, because it states in the Bible and, and extra biblical text about, you know, like the book of Enoch where there was a Nephilim and then there was a Rephium and a few others. So I think it's along that lineage, but not on a, mm. such a supernatural level. Um, 
I just think they're a remnant because it even states there were giants in Earth in those days and also after. <clears throat> I, I think yeah. that has something to do with it. That's for sure. I, mean, I, I thought deep about that too. It seems like to me the giants, they were killed and they lost their bodies. So maybe like the disembodied spirits that people experience is them because hell wasn't designed for them. It was designed for the devil and his angels and unfortunately right. for us. But them, I think they're stuck in between. You know, they don't have a place to go. And Right. And I think some of these uh, get... Uh, possessed or oppressed by some of these demonic type entities just by how they act and, and the kind of fear that they project it's just it's unnatural like i've had a startle with a brown bear like oh crap this is going to get ugly kind of situation but it was never a. it was a primal fear but it wasn't on this level this the it's hard to explain it was so intense of an oppressive fear it wasn't, it was like unnaturally, it, it wasn't my fear, but it was being put on me to, to fear, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, I understand. I guess where I was getting at earlier is, um, if it were the giants, you know, they've either died in the flood and the ones that did remain got killed off with it, you know, throughout all the years. But it also states in there that, you know, God was so disgusted with not just the people from that age and the giants and the angels and everything that was going on. He was also disgusted with the animals and the things that were oh, yeah. created, created by him. So he also wiped out the animals as well. So it kind of makes me right. think that if some of these giants lived, maybe some of the creatures from that age did as well. Yeah. And that's kind of my line of thinking as well, because it, it even states that, uh, you know, the, the fallen angels had corrupted all the fish of the sea, the beast of the field and whatnot. And I think that's where the dinosaurs come from, these things and various other things, you know. Um, there's a bunch of lore and myth about the little people back home, uh, call them the Sinksy. They're like little elves, for lack of a better word, little goblins or whatever. Uh, there's a bunch of stories of those things out there, too. Yeah, it's <laughs> about the little people and... You know, dogman stories, UFO stories, all kinds of cryptids, really. Yeah, and, you know, who's to, I mean, I was never big on the dogman thing, but if everything had been corrupted at one point and there's a remnant of them around, it's not out of bounds to think that way. You know what I mean? It's, it's not unheard of. Mm -hmm. And for some people, they're so caught up in the day-to-day -day rat race that they can't even begin to wrap their minds around the reality of what goes on in the rest of the world because not everything is concrete and asphalt <laughs> there's places that i know i've been up here in alaska that no one else has been you know what i mean at least where i happen to be standing there's so many remote places around that it's kind of arrogant to think that nothing like that could exist yeah, and if there are intelligent beings out there that we haven't fully discovered, they're going to be more intelligent to, than us, and we wouldn't even be aware of their presence. And that kind of seems to be what's going on with this situation. Right. Well, I've noticed one thing, too, that if you see one, there's at least a couple more around. And the one that's letting you see it is distracting you so you don't see the other ones. That's why when I initially heard that rustling, um, I, I, I pointed out to my relatives, don't just stare, look around, you know, don't get stuck on that one point, be aware of it, but, you know, make sure that there's nothing moving on us. Cause it, until you've been hunted, it, it's hard to explain how it feels in those moments. Um, it, it feels so unnatural to be a hunter that's being hunted. Like if, if you've dealt with it at all, you can pick up on certain uh, things hunters will do, distraction, um, whatever it may be. It's just a feeling that uh, it's hard to explain. Do, you, do they ever, like, triangulate around you? Like, not just come from one area, but all of a sudden they all come in at the same time from kind of every direction around you? Uh, that's what happened on the riverbank. Uh, all that transpired in a very short period of time. Um, with the owl hoots 
and the one crossing the river. It all total until we were drifting away from the bank was probably 25 minutes. And, and it got so overwhelmed feeling of, of dread and being hunted that w we, we left because initially we were just going to stay by the bonfire until first light, <clears throat> but it just got, they were coming in on us. Every time we heard a noise, it was closer. And again, it, it felt like, uh, it was done intentionally to invoke fear. Like, cause these things are fast. One of these things could have ran up and snatched us up and smashed us into our fire in a heartbeat. Like it, easily. I mean, just like I still have a hard time of why they didn't just smash that little shed and beat me against a tree. You know what I mean? Like it, it was a glorified matchbox. It, it was a glorified box. It, 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 it was just, uh, I don't know. There's certain things of it that I just can't, I accept it. I just can't wrap my mind around why it transpired that way. <laughs> I guess it's easy 2020 hindsight to get there and, you know, kind of overthink certain things and, and the way you handled certain situations. But there's just something about why they didn't just, because it, it was a little J hook on the door. I mean, a stiff breeze could have pushed this place over, you know? Yeah. Do you think that they could smell the food that you guys had in the shack? Uh, we kept the food um, outside, hanging in a tree, outside of just a couple canned good things that we were going to make for dinner that night. Mm -hmm. Did they we, we always stayed bear aware. I have no idea, man. <laughs> once, so you never once found we like saw blood them. or tr tracks or anything. Like you never looked. No, no. Uh, any finding of evidence or trying to investigate anything was all out the window. Uh, it's hard to explain. The fear was so, so intense that any logical thinking was gone. There, there was no logical. It was all survival. It was all primal. We're doing this so we can live. We're, 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 it was all mapped out step for step, getting the hell out of there. I mean, looking back on it, yeah, I wish, you know, I would have been able to been more uh, aware and paid more attention to, you know, certain things like uh, whatever it may be. But in the moment, it was, oh, hell no, no effing way is this happening. We got to go. That was the overwhelming feeling is, is you got to go, got to go. It, there was no no question of like making a stand and let's you know hold our ground none of that shit no uh -uh. i was i was ready to go yeah like around here well I, I, I shouldn't say just around missouri but states like missouri people are trying to interact with them and swap berries with them but up there in alaska you guys aren't trying to do that you guys are having bad encounters you know you guys are horrified by these things and all the villagers yeah because there's it's yeah it's never or... been yeah it's never been a uh even some of the folklore that we weren't necessarily taught as kids but you you know if, when you look into it you hear about it you wanted nothing to do with these things nothing good came of it you know your children end up missing your women go missing you, you uh they've killed dogs uh a buddy of mine had three of his sled dogs ripped in half and uh left on their chains like ugh, just uh mm. that'd be hard to deal with and the guy still lives in the same place yeah that'd be hard to know that they're out there somewhere watching you <laughs> and and that's the thing of it it's not like every time you go remote you're going to deal with it but if there's anything nearby the curiosity I feel is at such a heightened level because there's not that many of us that make it out there that immediately they want to not necessarily engage you, but they want to come and check you out. You know, they want to see what that noise is. They want to see what this is because it isn't until 
you start yelling or, or some commotion happens that they'll either run off. And a couple of times uh, we've had one run off and circle back out behind us at a further distance, just still eyeballing us. So it's like, uh, I feel it's because of the remoteness and the curiosity of them. They just naturally want to come in and check out what's going on in their backyard see who's making that noise who started that fire <clears throat> that kind of thing yeah that makes sense but there's never just one i've uh grant you i've only seen one here one there and a few you know handfuls here and there but each time i've only seen one i can guarantee there was more than just one just because of how things went in 06 with uh, I don't even know how many ended up running around that building and how many was total because we saw the three I shine, then the one next to the building. So that's four. If unless it was one of the ones we just seen ran over real quick and then leaned down and looked in. But it didn't feel that way because when we opened the door, eh, it was a totally different feel because <laughs> the eye shine was unmoving, unblinking. And we got that feeling. And so door shut. He ends up underneath the table almost immediately. And then we look over and see it. So there was at least four there. And then the big one. So that's five. <clears throat> and just looking back 2020 hindsight, I, I could see other instances where there's probably, like the one we saw in the open, making the click sound, the popping sound, or the wood knock sound, I should say. Uh, there was probably other ones around that we were being distracted from seeing because it stood there like uh, giving us the ugliest look um, of just hate. Uh, it was almost like the wood knocking sound was a challenge to us, like it was calling us out. And when none of us made a move, it got mad and ran off is how it felt in the moment. It was freaky shit and but looking back on it, it you know it challenged us we did nothing and it took off i speculated for a while that they they could be making the wood knock sounds with their mouth and this is one of the first stories i've ever heard where somebody actually saw one doing it so that's pretty cool yeah it sounded like two louisville sluggers smacking each other i mean loud <clears throat> And that's and that, that seems surreal, like to make that kind of noise and to project it at the it, I mean, it was 100 yards away, but we could hear it very loud. Uh, it, it, there was a concussion to it. You know, it was just uh, powerful. I mean, it makes sense to me because they they're just giant. You described that the big black one earlier and just the set of lungs that they have. And I'm sure they're they're mouth is just huge you know they got a huge tongue so if they did try to do some type of tongue clack and it, i mean i think it would sound like a wood knock they're that big yeah uh it, these things aren't i don't know they're even the little ones we saw that they, they have a certain girth to them um except okay the one we saw out in the open that was making the the popping sound the wood knock with its mouth it looked skinny but it wasn't um it looked more spindly than some of the other ones we've seen like a patty or what have you it looked like a, a chewbacca a little more stout broader shoulders with the head lowered on the shoulders <laughs> but it it was really big so in in contrast to size it, it looked skinny but it was still massive if that makes sense yeah so it kind of seems like to me the Bigfoot and the lower 48 are kind of trying to break that, I don't know, that division between them and humans and maybe interact a little bit more because they don't have another choice. But out there, I mean, I feel like if I brought some apples and some gifts to an area where they've been, they just swipe it off the table and go on with their day. Or swipe you and leave the apples for someone else. Yeah, it doesn't seem like they're interested in like the whole gifting scene and the interaction part out there. They do 
what they would normally do naturally. And if you run across them, it's not going to be okay. You know, here's some berries and yeah, no, it's immediately territorial and they're going to defend it. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, uh, that's overwhelming feeling I got was it it went territorial and uh, you're in danger. And I've heard, and I'm curious to the, Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off, but uh, I'm curious as to the observers for fishing game, what kind of stories they have, because there's some <laughs> uh, there's some PhD guys that are trying to get their doctorate in biology going up into these places doing the fish counting with the weir tower. I wonder what kind of stuff they had happen. I mean, they're out there, so I'm sure they're experiencing a bulk of the activity. Oh yeah, because they're they're there for weeks at a time. We were there less than freaking twenty four hours before shit went sideways. So uh, I don't know if it was just uh, luck of the draw because they had, uh, the fish and game observers had been gone for weeks at this time because they're only there till uh, probably the end of July, and then we went up mid September. So. <clears throat> I'm sure there is a seasonal aspect to it as well. Not that they migrate, but I think they have certain areas they stay because there's valleys up there all over the place that easily could hide a million of these things and we would never know. Yeah. Okay. Well, I think that answers most of my questions that I've had. I mean, a lot of them you kind of answered when you were telling your story, so I kind of marked them off the list. But, um, yeah, I think we got a good show in, and I really appreciate you getting in touch with me and telling your encounters. I know that one really spooked you and messed with you for a long time, and I'm sure it always will, but I appreciate you telling it to us. Yeah, eventually I want to, logistically it's such a pain to get to where that happened because it's, I mean, yeah, you could fly in, but I would rather have some mode of river or ground transportation to be able to retreat or have the the plane right there, but then I'd be worried they'd throw a rock at it, you know, I don't know, there's certain, after that experience, I, I don't feel as safe that remote just because of what transpired if i had the funds to go out there i'm not saying i do but let's say some rich person was like i want you to go out there and camp with this guy and film if we went out there what do you think would happen i think we would be accosted at some point um that's one of the areas i feel that if you're there for any period of time you're going to have some kind of of encounter um, and I say that because I feel, uh, they're very territorial about those places, especially that time of year. Like I noticed in the fall, um, it's a heightened aggression. They're aggressive regardless, but other times like we've seen them in the winter time and they'd just kind of be a tree peeker, you know, peeking from a tree kind of looking at you from a a distance away but it seems like in the fall they're highly aggressive and territorial so if i was to do something like that i would probably go early mid-september and see what happens yeah i think it'd be fun well not the whole terrifying bigfoot part (laughs) but uh salmon fishing and seeing (laughs) wildlife right you know I was going up for a black bear and some gold panning. So I was in mindset of getting rich. Uh, I was not, it wasn't even on my radar that we were going to have to deal with what we dealt with. So, but knowing that now I would totally approach a a trip like that in a different way. Cause I don't feel that these modern cameras and stuff would work as far as catching them on it. I'm thinking go old school with the old VHS recorder, you know what I mean? And uh, something not as technologically advanced that they seem to pick up on. Um, Let me ask you real quick. Did you uh, do any digging at the area before the the encounters happened? Nope. Didn't even, outside of getting the gear out of the skiff and up into the little shack. Nope. But that 
that was the intention to go up there and dig around for gold and pan. Yeah, because it's just south of the proposed pebble mine. It, it's rich in quartz and granite and gold up there. Yeah. Well, I was going to say, if you did dig up, maybe that was uh, what caused the activity. Because I heard if you go in certain areas and you dig up things, that's what causes the paranormal activity or whatever transpires. But no, you didn't dig. So. Right. No, we, we just showed up. We unloaded stuff. We weren't overly loud. We weren't popping shots off or hooping it up, you know, whooping it up drinking. We just unloaded our gear and they were playing cards quietly and I was dicking around with my sights. <laughs> and I was adjusting the ghost, the rear ghost ring on the shotgun because I noticed it was the, the windage was a little too far left. But yeah, it was intense, man. Um, yeah, my heart rate's still up thinking about it, but I wouldn't wish that on anybody. Like, hey, you know, do your thing, search for whatever, do what you got to do, but just be careful what you wish for because if you come across one of these things in that state, it's not going to go well. Yeah. Okay. Well. How often do you get out and, and get to, like, go tramps around in the woods and explore? I try to every other day. I normally don't oh, bring a rifle, cool. though. I just go out there, bring, you know... Just my cell phone, really. Sometimes I'll bring a gun, you know, if I'm hunting or if it's hunting season, just whatever. But most of the times that I go out in the forest, I just, you know, go out there to chill and walk around, explore. Yeah, I guess it's a little different up here, though, because there's so many different critters and, and whatnot. It's like second nature to always have something with you when you go out in the woods. <clears throat> And as a matter of fact, if you go to fish and game and are the troopers and say, hey, I'm going to be remote here or wherever. One of the first things they're going to ask you is you bring in a gun. We recommend you bring a gun. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Unless, of course, you're a prohibited possessor or something like that. But, you know, they encourage you to be prepared to defend yourself. Yeah. Anything could happen up there being so remote or just being anywhere. Yeah, it's definitely a different animal. Once you get to see some of the pictures of the area I'm telling you about, you'll see what I'm talking about. Okay. Yeah, you'll have to send me over some coordinates or locations for me to look up, and I'll look them up. Yeah, if you just uh, Google the Wood Tick Chick National Park, man, it'll bring up a whole slew of mountainous valleys and rivers. And Okay, Fred. Well... I appreciate it, and you have a good night, and be safe out there, and stay warm, man. Oh, always. You too, man. We'll talk to you later. All right. You have a good night. All right. Yeah, bye. All right. Thank you for those who made it this far, and I know it was a long one. So it appears that not all the Sasquatch like humans, and it is possible that going into these remote areas could put you at greater risk with running into one of these clans. Overall, it was a very fascinating story, and I really learned a lot about the Sasquatch's behavior. Anyways, that's all for this episode, and I will catch you guys on the next one. Take care, everyone.